looking at Matthew chapter 6. We're still in our summer series, even though summer seems to be starting to wrap up. School gets started here pretty soon and such, but uh, we've got a few more weeks in our summer series, which is on the Sermon on the Mount, um, and so I think we've got two or three more weeks. After that, we're going to be uh, switching for the fall to a new series on Hebrews chapter 11, um, and so the teaching team is going to be taking us through that really incredible chapter out of the Bible, and that's going to take us up through Christmas. So lots of great stuff coming up on Sunday mornings, but this morning we are in Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to pick it up in verse 19. Here's what it says. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Let's pray. Father God, as we come into this place this morning, it is good to know that we are in your presence. That God, you, as we come and we sing praises, God, you are here present listening to us as we sing. And now God, as we open up your word, God, as we read what you have for us this morning, as we, as we hear from your word, God, we are hearing the voice of God. And so, God, I pray this morning that you would help us to be ready for what you have for us. God, soften our hearts to hear this passage. God, I pray that you will um, have us be ready wherever we're at, no matter what happened this week. If it was a hard week or an easy week, God, I pray that we would be ready and expectant to hear from you this morning. God, I'm grateful that you've given us your word, that that your will for us is not nebulous or vague, but God, you are very, very clear on what you want for us and how we should live. And so I'm grateful for that this morning, and I pray that, God, we'd be responsive to that as we come to this passage this morning. God, it is good to be in your presence. It is good to be with your people. And God, we want this morning for you to receive the glory in all that we do today, in Jesus' name. Amen. This summer, we have been in one of Jesus' most famous teachings, the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount goes all the way from Matthew chapter 5 all the way through chapter 7. And we are in chapter 6 today, and we've been in chapter 6 for a few weeks. And if I were to summarize what chapter 6 has been telling us so far, it's really captured in verse 1, where it says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people to be seen by them. And then in chapter 6, Jesus warns us three different times in in Matthew chapter 6 that if we practice our righteousness to be seen by other people, then truly we have received our reward. He says this three different times. In verse 2, he says, those who give to be seen by others have already received their reward. In verse 5, he says, those who pray to be seen by others will have already received their reward. And then in verse 16, he says, those who fast to be seen by others will have already received their reward. But Jesus also tells us that if we practice our righteousness, not to be seen by others, but instead with the sincerity of heart, then your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And so we see in verse 4 that those who give in secret will be rewarded. Verse 6, those who pray in secret will be rewarded. Verse 18, those who fast in secret will be rewarded. And so really the point of the first 18 verses of chapter 6 is this. You can receive your reward now or you can receive your reward later. And the question that Jesus asks of all of us is, do you want your reward here and now, or do you want to have your reward in heaven? And this morning now, as we take a look at verses 19 through 24 of chapter 6, Jesus is going to warn us that there is a significant downside to taking your reward now, and there's significant upside in taking your reward in heaven. In verses 2 through 18, Jesus warns his followers that they should, not claim, they should not crave earthly acclaim. And now in verses 19 to 24, Jesus is going to warn his followers that neither should we crave earthly things. Jesus is going to warn us this morning that materialism is incompatible with following him. Materialism is incompatible with following Jesus. 
And Jesus uses three illustrations to demonstrate this. Three illustrations to show us how materialism is incompatible with following Jesus. First, he's going to use the illustration of a treasure in verses 19 to 21. Secondly, the illustration of an eye in verses 22 and 23. And third, the illustration of a master and a slave in verse 24. And as we look at these three illustrations, Jesus is going to confront us with three questions. First, where is our treasure? Where, who, how is our vision? And who is our master? So those three questions are going to be our outline today. Number one, where is our treasure? Verses 19 to 21. Secondly, how is our vision? Verses 21 to 23. And then finally, who is our master? In verse 24. Jesus is showing us that materialism is incompatible with following him. So the first illustration he uses to demonstrate this is the illustration of the treasure. And Jesus is going to ask us this question, where is your treasure? Look with me at verses 19 to 21. He says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's two terms worth defining here as we look at this paragraph. The first term is the term lay up. The word lay up here in the original Greek means to save or to invest. In modern economic terms, we could say do not save up or do not invest or save up or invest. The second term is the term treasure. Now, when we think of treasure in, as the English word treasure, you know, we, I immediately think like a pirate's buried treasure or some like chest filled with gold coins or something like that. But the Greek word translated here as treasure is just the noun form of the word that we just translated as save or lay up. So if lay up means to save or invest, then the noun form of that would be savings or investment. So if we were to translate this paragraph in more modern economic terms, we might say it this way. Do not save up or invest for yourselves savings and investments on earth, but save up and invest for yourselves savings and investments in heaven. And Jesus gives us two investment options. We can either invest in earthly things or we can invest in heavenly things. Now, choosing between investments can often be a really difficult thing. I often have people come to me and ask me for investment advice. I, I work at a bank, and so people assume that I'm knowledgeable about investments. Actually, my area of expertise within banking is credit policy and credit modeling, and I really don't know a lot about investments, but people still come to me anyway, assuming I know something about it. And, and I get it, because the world of investing can be really confusing. There's, there's so many investment options. Should, should I be paying off my student loans or should I be saying up for a down payment on my house? Should, should I, how should I save for retirement? Should I use a traditional IRA or a, a Roth IRA? Should I, should I be putting money into my 401k? What's this stock market all about? What are mutual funds? There's so many options that people need a lot of help understanding how to invest in this minefield of investing. But Jesus says that really there's only two options when it comes to investments. You can either invest on earth or you can invest in heaven. And when you compare the returns of investing on earth to investing in heaven, the choice becomes really clear. You see, if you invest in earthly investments, you're investing in a place where, where moth and rust will destroy and where thieves will break in and steal. Now, in our modern economy, our investments aren't really subject to the same physical deterioration that Jesus' audience would have. I, I don't think your, your moth is going to go eat up your, uh, your bank account. Nonetheless, our earthly investments are no more safe and secure than they were in Jesus' day. Let me give you an example of this. The Great Recession took place now about 10 years ago. And it was October 2007 that the stock market hit its pre-recessionary high. And by March of 2009, the, market, the stock market dropped by 50%. What that meant for me personally is that I had been building up my retirement savings for 20 years. And in 18 months, I lost half the value of my retirement savings. 20 years of investments gone in 18 months. The average American lost one-third of its net worth during the recession of 2008. So we may not have moths or rust to worry about, but we do have to worry about a recessionary economy. What about thieves breaking into steel? I mean, most of us probably don't keep our money in, in, in cash in a, in, underneath our mattress where we're worried about thieves breaking in and stealing. And yet, nonetheless, we do have people who are out to get our money. Just last year, two men from Eugene were convicted and sent to prison for bilking 400 investors out of $40 million. It was Lane County's largest ever Ponzi scheme. 
And I know several people who lost their money to these guys, lost their life savings to these con men. So today Jesus would tell us to not lay up treasures for yourself on earth where the stock market or the housing market might destroy and where con men and crooks might bilk you out of your life savings. Turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 16. Because you see, even if you are lucky enough to put all of your investments into the right places in the stock market or wherever, or even if you're smart enough to avoid crooks and con men, there is one thing about earthly investments that none of us can afford. Take a look at what it says in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 16. And he, meaning Jesus, told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. See, your 401k may recover from the Great Recession. You may be smart enough to avoid the crooks and the conmen, but there's one thing that none of us can avoid with our earthly investments, and that's death itself. And when you die, all of your investments are left behind. As the old saying goes, you can't take it with you. Or as somebody else once put it, you'll never see a hearse towing a U-Haul trailer. But Jesus gives us an alternative investment. He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And this is an investment that cannot be diminished by a recession. This is an investment that can't be stolen by thieves and by con men. And most importantly, this is an investment which survives your death and is eternal. This is an investment in heaven itself. So how do I do that? How do I invest in heaven? Do, do I go to my stockbroker? Do I go to my investment advisor and say, hey, can you tell me what's, where's the heavenly mutual fund? How do, how do I actually do that? Well, to find that out, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And here, Paul is going to tell Timothy how to invest in heavenly things. 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're going to pick it up in verse 17. Paul says this to Timothy. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So how do we lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven? How do we store up treasures for ourselves as a good foundation? 1 Timothy 6 gives us two ways. First, it says that we are to do good, to be rich in good works. And you get the play on words that, that is being used here by Paul, because he says those who are rich with material things should be rich in good works. And so we store up treasures in heaven when we use our money to do good works for the glory of God. We store up treasures when we use our money in a way that promotes the kingdom of God. Now, there's some real obvious ways that we can do that. Obviously, we can give to the church or some other organization that preaches the gospel. But it also comes in a lot of other more subtle ways. Let's say you offer to pay for someone to, for, for coffee when you take them out. And you sit down and have coffee with them and you talk to them about with their walk with Jesus. What if you buy yourself flour and chocolate chips and go bake a plate of cookies and take it to your neighbors across the street? It could be buying school supplies for the kids here at Cal Young Middle School. It could be give, donating money to our annual Boxes of Love outreach. All of those is being rich in good works. It's using our money in a way that promotes the kingdom of God. But secondly, he says that we are to be generous and we are to be ready to share. We need to recognize that the wealth that we have, no matter what wealth God has given to us, the wealth and the resources that God has provided to us are not for our own personal consumption but they're there to have us share with others. God blesses us so that we can bless others. And we need to hold on to our earthly riches with an open hand, and we need to be willing to share with others. 
So 1 Timothy tells us that when we do this, we are storing up treasures for ourselves as a good foundation for the future. Turn back to Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus sums this all up in verse 24, excuse me, verse 21, where he says, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Notice the order in which Jesus puts this principle. He says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. He does not say where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. What he's saying is that where you put your treasure forms your heart. That is, how you use your money will mold and shape your heart. That means our heart can be cultivated and developed in the way that we use our money. And if we invest in earthly investments, then our heart is being shaped and formed into earthly values. But if we invest in heavenly investments, our heart will be formed and shaped into heavenly values. Because Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It follows. Michael Rhodes, in his book, Practicing the King's Economy, states it this way. He says, in this passage, Jesus doesn't give us a thermometer to measure the temperature of our hearts, but a thermostat to change the temperature of your hearts. Because how you use your money will mold and shape your heart. Think of it this way. If, if I were to buy stock in a company, let's say I decide to buy stock in Nike or Apple or something like that, all of a sudden now, I'm going to start caring about what happens to that company. And so if I see a headline or a, or a news feed on my phone about that company, I'm going to click on it. Why? Because I'm literally invested in that. And so where I've put my money is starting to shape my interests. It's starting to shape what I look at and what I think about because where I put my money affects my heart. Well, the same is true if I invest in the things of the kingdom of God. Let's say that I decided to give money to help train pastors at the Verse by Verse Bible School in Burkina Faso. And I give money to that. All of a sudden, I'm going to start becoming more aware of what's happening in Burkina Faso. So if I see a headline about them, I'm going to click on that headline and read about it because I'm invested in that. I care what happens now where I put my money. And so I'm paying attention and I'm praying for those pastors because now I'm literally invested in a Bible school and I'm invested in what happens to those pastors in West Africa. Because where you put your money will shape your interests. It will shape your heart. It will mold who you are. So if you want to gain an internal perspective on life, if you want to be committed to the gospel, if you want to become a more selfless and giving person, you start molding your heart by giving your money to those things. You don't wait for your heart to be changed and then give. You give, and in the process of giving, your heart will be shaped. So investing in earthly things will shape your heart towards earthly things. Investing in heavenly things will shape our heart toward heavenly things. Because Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So throughout chapter 6, what I really see Jesus doing is he wants us to take an eternal perspective. He wants us to understand that this life is not all there is. That there is life after this one. And how we live today should be creating a foundation, not to just make us comfortable here and now, but to lay a foundation for the life that is to come. Jesus wants to expand our perspective. He wants us to lift our eyes above the earthly things and to see that there is much, much more to come. You see, this really all comes down to our eschatology. Our eschatology. Eschatology is just a fancy way of saying the study or our understanding of the last days. And what we believe about life and death and the ultimate fate of this world will influence how we live today. Think of it this way. If this material world is all that exists, if there is no life after death, then that's going to influence how you live today. If we believe that this life is all there is, then you're going to live with an earthly mindset. And that earthly mindset is found at hashtags we use all the time. You find this in the YOLO hashtag. You guys know YOLO, Y-O-L-O? For those of you over 40, YOLO stands for you only live once. And if you believe that, if you, that means you have to experience all that you can right now. Why? Because you only get one crack at life. You only get one shot at this. And so I need to experience all I can right now. You only live once. What about the hashtag that says, your best life now? You guys seen this on Instagram? This is popping up all the time in my feed. My, my best life now, or live your best life now. If you believe that there's nothing coming after you die, that's exactly true. This is your best life right now. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. 
Revelation 21 is a vision of what will happen in the future after Jesus returns to earth. And in Revelation 21, Jesus tells us that YOLO is a lie. We don't only live once. In fact, if we're in Christ, we're going to live for eternity. Revelation 21 tells us that our best life is not right now. Our best life is to come. Take a look at what it says in Revelation 21. Then I saw the new heaven and the new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. People, we have this to look forward to. Jesus is making a new heaven. He is making a new earth And he is going to make all things new. He's going to wipe away every tear from his eye. And he's going to abolish death itself. And most importantly, as it says in verse 3, God will dwell with his people. Behold, the dwelling place of God will be his people. I do not think that we can even begin to imagine how amazing and glorious it'll be to live on the new earth, dwelling with God himself. And I think if we could capture just a glimpse of the life to come, we would never settle for such a shallow, you only live once lifestyle. People, there is so much better to look forward to. Our problem is that we're far too easily satisfied. We're far too easily satisfied with the things of this world when Jesus offers us a future that is far more glorious and exciting and amazing than anything this world has to offer. In his book, The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, we are an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. People, let's aim a little higher. Let's look to the future rather than the present. Let's put our eyes on heavenly things rather than things on earth. Let's stop settling for mud pies in the slum when Jesus is offering us a holiday at sea. Now, does this mean that it's wrong for us to have adventures, to to go out and have new experiences? No, not at all. But if we are seeking adventure out of some sort of desperate attempt to cross things off our bucket list before we die, that may be an indication that we don't really understand what's yet to come for us. So sure, go skydiving, travel to Europe, go to Machu Picchu, whatever you want out on your bucket list. That's awesome. That's great. But don't ever think that any adventure or any experience in this life has any comparison at all to the adventure that we will have on the new heaven and the new earth after Jesus comes back. This, this means that it's wrong for us to plan or to save for the future. Should I not be saving for retirement? Is that what I'm saying? No, not at all. The book of Proverbs makes it really clear that you're a fool if you're not saving your money. But we can also take saving our money into an idol. Listen again to what Michael Rhodes says. He says, savings often masquerades as a distorted form of stewardship that tricks us into thinking that God honestly prefers that we're shored up against every possible financial disaster before opening wide our hands to the marginalized. Sometimes we think, oh, God surely wants me to have all of my financial ducks in a row before I can start giving to others. And that's completely the wrong perspective. So sure, save for retirement. Save for a down payment for your house, that's fine. But let's never use our financial security or our savings as an excuse not to be giving away our money to people in need or to give it to God's kingdom work. Don't be fooled. How we spend our time and how we spend our money will shape our heart. Because Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so the first question that Jesus has for us this morning is this. Where's our treasure? Where's our treasure? Jesus is showing us that materialism is incompatible with following him. The second illustration that Jesus uses is the illustration of the eye. The illustration of the eye. And Jesus is going to ask us this second question. How's our vision? 
How's our vision? Take a look back in Matthew chapter 6 at verses 22 and 23. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Think about what a lamp does. A a lamp spreads light. Now, when I go camping, I'm always amazed. After you kind of get into the tent at night, and you get all tucked into your sleeping bag, and then you turn off the lantern or you turn off your flashlight, how incredibly dark it is. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's just incredibly dark because you're out in the country, you're not in the city, there's no street lamps, there's no cars driving by with headlights. It's just like pitch black. And then you turn on your flashlight and maybe it's one of those little flashlights that just has like one little LED and like the whole tent lights up with this little tiny flashlight. That's because if the flashlight's working, the whole tent will be lit. But if the flashlight isn't working, then the entire tent is in darkness. And Jesus says, so it is with our eyes. Because our eyes let the light into the body. And so if the light, if the eye is working, then the light will come in. But if the eye is not working, you will be in darkness. The eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be in the light. If your eye is bad, the whole body will be in darkness. Now the term healthy here, when it says a healthy eye, it means singular and clear. It it means an eye that has a clarity of vision. It means our vision is not blurred, we're not seeing double, we're able to focus. Conversely, the term bad eye here, or sometimes translated evil eye, is actually a Jewish idiom, which means to be selfish or to be envious. In fact, this term, this evil eye or this bad eye, is actually translated as the word envy, both in Matthew 20, 15 and in Mark 7, 22. So the healthy person, the person with a healthy eye, brings light into the body. But the person with a bad eye or an evil eye will have a body in selfishness and in darkness. And Jesus says, if the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I think we have trouble understanding these particular verses because our culture has a wrong understanding of what it means to have light inside. Today, there's a lot of people who talk about the fact that we we may have some sort of divine inner light within us. But Jesus actually doesn't say that. He doesn't say that there's a light within us that the eyes are letting the light escape. What he's saying is the only light within us is the light that, the, uh, that comes in from the outside. Our eyes let the light in. And so if our eyes are looking at the wrong things, then we will have darkness inside of us. If our eyes are looking at the right things, then we'll have light within us. We don't have an inner light waiting to come out. We're bringing the light in through what we see with our eyes. The only light we have is admitted through our eyes. In other words, just as our heart is shaped by where we put our treasures... So our desires are going to be shaped by what we see with our eyes. Our desires are shaped by what we see with our eyes. Throughout the Bible, the eyes are described as the seat of our desires. We see this in Genesis 3, in the fall of humanity. When the serpent tempted Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, it says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, she took and ate the fruit. She saw the fruit with her eyes. It was the desire of her eyes that caused her to take the fruit and to eat because our eyes are the seat of our desires. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father but from the world. So the question is, how is your vision? What are you looking at? What are you looking at when you're looking on your phone? What, What are you watching on your television According to Jesus, what you're looking at is shaping your desires. And if we spend all of our time looking at earthly things, then our desires will be for earthly things. But if we spend our time looking at heavenly things, then our desires will be for heavenly things. Because just as our heart is shaped by where we put our treasure, so our desires are shaped by what we see with our eyes. The eye is the lamp of the body. So the second question Jesus asks for us today is, how's our vision What are we looking at? What are we looking at? Jesus is showing us that materialism is incompatible with following him. And the third illustration he uses to demonstrate this is the illustration of a master and a slave. And Jesus is going to ask us this very hard question. Who is your master? Who is your master? Take a look at Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, 
or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. To be clear, Jesus is using this slave-master relationship as an illustration. He's not making a commentary, a moral commentary on slavery itself. Instead, he's just using a fundamental principle of slavery to explain something. That a person can't serve two masters. You, you never have a slave that's owned by two different people. Because a master has complete control over what a slave does. And two people can't have complete control over one person. And so, you cannot have two different masters. Especially if those masters are asking you to do completely opposite and contradictory things. The slave will either hate one and love the other, or he will, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Jesus then applies this principle to our relationship to God and our relationship to money. And he says, you cannot serve God and money. There's two really interesting rhetorical things that are going on here in this last sentence. First of all, you may not have noticed it, but Jesus moves from the third person to the second person. So in the first part of this verse, he says, no one can serve two masters. It's a general principle. Nobody in general can do that. But then he switches from the third person to the second person, and he says, you cannot serve God and money. He makes it personal. He makes it applicable to you and me. He drives it home. Secondly, Jesus takes this generic term for money, and he turns it into a proper noun. What do I mean by that? He's taking this comprehensive word that's used to mean possessions or riches or wealth, and he personifies it as if it's the name of a god. And he's saying, you can't serve two different gods at the same time. You either are going to serve the Lord God Almighty, or you're going to serve the Almighty Buck. But you can't do both. These masters are going to demand of you two very opposite and contradictory things. And you'll either love God and hate money, or you will love money and hate God. You'll either be devoted to God and despise money, or you'll be devoted to money and despise God, but you can't do both. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. We're going to pick it up in verse 16. In this passage, we're going to see Jesus confront a young man who's trying to serve two different masters. And his interaction with Jesus is very convicting for us. Matthew chapter 19, picking it up in verse 16. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to them, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who does good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbors yourself. The young man said to him, all of these I've kept. What, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go. Sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is possible, is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Jesus tells this man, sell what you possess and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Jesus is drawing a line in the sand with this rich young man. He says, look, you can either serve your possessions or you can serve me. You can either pursue wealth and your treasures here on earth or you can pursue me and have your treasure in heaven. And I would suggest to you this morning that Jesus is asking the very same question of us as he is this young man. He's asking, who is your master? Are you going to pursue material things, material experiences, the things of this earth, or are you going to pursue me? And as we think about this, we somehow start playing games with God because we want to think that we're the exception to this rule. That somehow God is going to let me still pursue material things and still be able to serve him. So we start playing mind games with God. G.K. Chesterton once said that instead of dealing with what Jesus says about money, we try to figure out how to manufacture ever larger needles and breed ever smaller camels. 
We think that if we just give 10% of our money to the church, that that sum is going to satisfy God, that, that he'll let us keep the rest and, and we can do both. I give God a little bit over here, he's okay, he's fine, and then I can do whatever I want over here. But here's the problem. God doesn't want 10% of your money. He wants 100% of your life. Here's the problem. God wants 100% of your life. D.A. Carson, no relation, says it this way. Either God is served with a single-eyed devotion or he is not served at all. Attempts at divided loyalty betray not a partial commitment to discipleship, but a deep-seated commitment to idolatry. And some of us this morning are in deep-seated idolatry to money. And we come to church and we play and we pretend to be serving God, but really we are serving money. So the question Jesus has for you this morning is, who's your master? Who's your master? Jesus is laying out for us three choices. He's saying, where's your treasure? Is it in earth or is it in heaven? Where's your vision? Are you looking at earthly things or are you looking at heavenly things? Who's your master? Is it God or is it money? And if we invest in earthly treasure, our hearts will be formed by those earthly things and our eyes are going to become clouded with the pursuit of selfish desires and we're going to end up worshiping money as our God. However, if we invest in heavenly treasure, then our hearts are going to be sincerely put into heavenly things. Our eyes will become clear as we're able to focus and pursue godly desires and we will end up truly and worshiping God and serving him. And if we do that, we are laying up for ourselves a foundation of treasure in heaven. It's really a pretty simple choice if you think about it. Earthly treasures, selfish desires, the God of money may give us some short-term fulfillment, but that investment ultimately is going to leave you with nothing. Heavenly treasure, however, selflessness, serving Jesus may in the short run cost us a little bit, but in the long run we will have more, more treasure than we can even imagine. This investment lasts forever. So if you think about it, the decision is actually pretty simple. But what it really comes down to is, do we really believe in Jesus? Do we really believe in Jesus or not? Look, the whole thing, if this whole thing about Jesus isn't true, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and then when you die, that's all there is, if Jesus isn't coming back someday to deliver the kingdom, then use your money however you like. Why not? What does it matter? If this whole stuff about Jesus isn't true, then I would say relax, eat, drink, be merry. Spend your money on incredible adventures. But you better get busy doing it right now because this life is short and you only live once. And once you're dead, your best life is all over. There's nothing more than this. But if this thing about Jesus is true, if Jesus really did rise from the dead, then he can raise you from the dead as well. If Jesus really is coming someday back to bring about his kingdom, then it makes a lot of sense for us to temporarily give up these material things so that we can take possession of our heavenly treasure. If Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is true, it makes complete sense to spend all your money on helping other people learn the truth about Jesus. It makes complete sense to invest in people and to aim to bring glory to God with our money because that investment will pay dividends eternally. In Matthew 13, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Have you ever thought what the innocent bystander thought of this guy who sold everything to buy a vacant lot? I was thinking, you ever think, why would this guy sell everything to buy a vacant lot? Well, what's the problem with that? They don't realize that this man knows that buried in that field is a treasure worth more than everything that he's sold. And people, Jesus is that treasure hidden in the field. And that treasure that we have in Jesus is worth more than anything that this material world has to offer. And you would be a fool not to give up everything in order to gain the treasure that is Jesus. If you don't know Jesus this way, if you have never experienced the treasure of a relationship with him, I'm here to tell you that pursuing Jesus is worth everything. He is worth giving up absolutely everything that you own in order to follow him. He doesn't ask you to earn that treasure. Jesus has already earned that for us. And if you think about it, what Jesus did is he willingly gave up everything so that we could pursue him. He gave up his very life 
so that we can pursue him. And so he is worth it for us to give up everything in order to gain salvation from him. He only asks that we freely receive the gift of salvation. And if we have received that gift, if you are a follower of Jesus, then are we living like he is our ultimate treasure or are we still holding on to earthly pursuits and earthly desires? We need to all sit and evaluate. Are we pursuing Jesus like he really is our treasure? Where's your treasure? How's your vision? Who's your master this morning? May we be people who lift our eyes up off earthly things, look to what's to come, and invest in heaven with a singular vision to serve God as our master wholeheartedly. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.